We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Antry and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, yeah, did Google change something behind the scenes? Oh, jeez. Uh, if you're looking at... Don't uh, worry about it. I know. Yeah, whatever. If you look at YouTube, about you want the completed version. We already talked to those people. We did. We talked we to are, those people. Well, people sometimes listen to the podcast and then go but check out the videos. So. some of you may want to go watch the uh, video. And when you do, you'll be able to see me and my... Uh, I got my new embroidered shirts. Yeah. Uh, and I'm I can't even see Tom to... right now. We can't see each other this week. I don't know can't if that's going to affect anything. I got, I'm wearing it because I went to a civic, the, the local civic association's meeting, uh-huh. monthly meeting. <laughs> it was ex- as the first one I've ever been to, and it's probably going to be the last. <laughs> but it was exactly everything I thought it was going to be. It was a bunch of people who essentially wanted to waste everybody else's time yeah. by being angry about things that are they are 100% wrong okay. about. <laughs> like, my my wife's an engineer, right? So these people are really angry. There's a couple things going on in our neighborhood. Uh, there's a bridge that needs to be repaired. Yeah. And they're like, how come it's not done? I'm like, <laughs> what do you mean? What do you think they're going to do? Knock it down and build it back up in a day? Come on. <laughs> it takes, this is government. It takes a long uh-huh. time to get anything done. And the guy's super angry about that. My wife's like, and he, he's making all these claims about all this stuff. And my wife's an engineer. So she's stayed behind that talk. Yeah. I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. You deal with the crazy people. I am out of here. And geez, I mean, there's this like gaggle of boys that ride bikes around the neighborhood with no helmets on. And it, make, it drives me nuts. Okay. Right. Not because I really care, but because. You know, they're not wearing helmets, and I'm worried about their safety. Mm -hmm. But I guarantee you there's somebody in this neighborhood right now who's ready to take up arms and string these kids up because they're they're not being properly supervised or whatever. I'm like, who cares? They're playing in wood piles on on one of the vacant lots around the corner from my house. Let, let Let them do it. Just relax. Oh, no. They're really angry about stuff around here. That's that's how really civic angry. things go. Yeah. I voted in, our, in my local civic elections a week early. So I know. I saw that. I did that. Yeah. <laughs> We're about to have an election around here, too. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to vote for things. Not sure what. Probably whatever my wife tells me to vote for. But we'll see. All right. Uh, this is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You go to www.avrant.com and uh, leave us a comment there. I fixed the login thing. Ooh. Fancy. So now you can now you can log in again. So nice. good, good on me. Uh, Websites coming that. along just as our videos break. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <sighs> we are. Oh yeah, it's it's always something it's fun around work here. In progress. It's only been it's only been six hundred episodes, but yeah, we'll get the website sorted eventually. Yep. Another six hundred episodes, and it'll be just tight. It'll be Web two point for sure by then. Um, you can go to www. I'm going to say Facebook.com slash AV Rant Podcast. Uh-huh. That's a good way to contact us. YouTube.com slash AV Rant. If you want to contact us directly, it's Rob at AV Rant.com. His Twitter is at First Reflect. I'm Tom at AV Rant.com. My Twitter is at AV Rant underscore Tom. There are, there so are people have a, on our YouTube live thing right now furiously logging out and back in because they think something's wrong, I am sure. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. If, if you just logged out, I guess you won't hear this, but no, this is the behind the scenes for this week. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Put uh, a comment in there. Why don't you write a uh, quick comment? While I'm, I'm not even going to touch YouTube right now. I can hear you, and I believe my video is record- recording locally. I'm leaving it at that. I touch nothing else <laughs> right now. God. Google. I'll do it. I'm on my Mac. A Mac is brick. Uh, hey, all you got to do is plug a Mac into an alien spaceship and it breaks it. It's that's right. Day. USB. All right. USB, baby. <laughs> the, the universal Truly ports universal. of all space, <laughs> spacecraft. Right. right. All right. So uh, we want to thank our listeners of the week to become a listener of the week. All you have to do is support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is by going to www.avrant.com. Click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link. That will send you to a PayPal donation site where you can they will take your credit card number or your PayPal information and give us some monies. So we want to thank Brandon for doing that this week. So thank you very much, Brandon. Yeah, Brandon, thank you very much for the donation. We appreciate that. Those will go into our coffers to help pay for hosting fees and other stuff. So, yay! 
right. We also want to thank our 73 patrons over at patreon.com. Patreon's a service where you can uh, sign up for a monthly uh, take from your bank account and dole it out to your favorite content creators uh, to help support them. So we want to thank our 73 patrons over at patreon.com. Yeah, that's patreon.com slash podcast. If you'd like to sign up, a dollar per month is the minimum and uh, infinity per month is the maximum. So thanks very much to our 73 patrons over All there. we need is one one of those. One infinity. For one month. Do it. <laughs> one infinity and we'd be <laughs> set. We'd be a podcast a day. That's right. This is all we do. This is all we do. All right. Uh, if you can't support the podcast financially, we completely understand. But if you do think of a way to support the podcast, let us know, and we will mention you. So we want to thank Sean. Sean went with our recommendation and bought an RBH Impression R515 center to go with his first generation RBH towers that he already had. Weren't we worried that it wasn't going to be it was going to be too big? Is that what we were? No, he about? was he was trying to find a three way center that matched his three way towers, and we're like, uh, the new two way center will be just fine. Oh, okay. okay yeah. yeah. He says it made an incredible difference, and his wife loves how clear dialogue sounds now, even at lower volumes. Nothing better than the happy wife, he says. So he made sure to let RBH know it was our recommendation. So, well, congratulations, you, Sean, and Sean. thank you very much for the uh, letting RBH know. In the news, the first IMAX enhanced Ultra HD Blu-ray titles have been announced. And interestingly, they're also the first physical disc to use HDR10+. Mm-hmm. A Beautiful Planet and Journey to the South Pacific. Yep. Just sounds stunning. I mean, those are IMAX <laughs> things filmed with IMAX cameras. So. I understand. I understand. I'm sure they look really mm-hmm. good on the 35 foot wide screen but whatever <laughs> uh, anyways uh the audio is in dts x and the inclusion of hdr 10 plus is somewhat curious since only sony uh has have been officially announced in the imax enhanced display so far and they don't support hdr 10 plus they do not so what evs and samsung and panasonic are best known display brands that support hdr 10 plus but they haven't announced any imax enhanced Device, uh, displays yet, but I'm sure they will. I'm prob- sure Samsung probably, will. Yeah. Uh, the fact that Samsung yeah. brought out quite recently a new uh, sound bar that actually has physical rear speakers and upward firing drivers, so it's like they're doing the 5.1.4, but with actual drivers. They're not just trying to, like you know, pseudo sound it oh. around you. Uh, and Took me a second, man. You said physical rear speakers. I thought the sound bar had speakers pointing out the back no like, no like what? actual yeah, yeah, yeah wireless yeah, yeah. speakers yeah, you yeah. can physically put behind you and those have upward firing drivers in them so it's a true 5.1.4 yeah. set up with the upward firing drivers uh but they support dts x and i'm pretty sure that's the first samsung soundbar that does and of course dts x is the sound format being used by imax enhanced so it wouldn't surprise me Ooh. if like that product and their recent look TVs... at dts making a comeback yeah 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 so, the, I that mean, said, basically, I just, IMAX I Enhanced bought... is like the anti-Dolby format. <laughs> like, oh, you've got Dolby okay Atmos and Dolby Vision? Well, we have DTSX and HDR10+. Plus. That's what IMAX Enhanced is, apparently. So. Uh, okay, I'm all right with that. Yeah, as long as all the, t- all the displays do all the things, then we'll be fine. <laughs> um, yeah, I bought A Quiet Place on Blu-ray. Okay. I was going to buy it on Ultra H, whatever, 4K. Yeah. But uh, it was at Target, and it was $22, $23 for the... 4K, yeah, right. And it was on sale for 15 on Blu-ray. Okay. And Blu-rays has Atmos. Oh, okay. So yeah. I was that's like, the main thing. I'm out. Yeah, you don't have Yeah, that's the only thing I would buy it for. <laughs> I don't have a 4K display yeah, that's anyways. Right. I buy it for the yeah, Atmos. Yeah, yeah. So. All right. Uh, some comments real quick, or maybe just one out, a couple of comments. Nick wanted to highly recommend uh, that headphone DAC and amp reviews being done by an engineer going by the screen name MR... 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 A-M-I-R-M, anyway, all lowercase. Yeah, whatever. Uh, I guess over on the uh, Audio Science Review Forums. Mm-hmm. So this is, he probably, this guy probably doesn't get paid, right? I don't believe so. I mean, it's just a forum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's, he's yeah. taking so measurements and you, doing all the things. Yeah. yeah, I love it. I love yeah. it. I love I love it when people do this. But the thing is, as soon as you start paying that duty, he stops doing it. <laughs> it's so weird. So weird it happens all the time anyways. But hopefully he'll continue on. I mean, he's posted reviews of many, many headphone DACs and amps. Lots of units that get talked about on, the, on forums but never get professional website reviews. And what Nick likes is that he measures their noise floor as well as their maximum output and distortion levels. Plus, he offers his insights on things like customer support and how they subjectively perform uh, with the various headphones he has on hand. Nick thinks it's a great resource for anyone interested in some objective measurements of the many, many headphone DACs and amps out there. 
yeah, they looked like reasonable reviews. The measurements yeah. are such that, uh, oh boy, is that open to uh, misinterpretation by folks who don't really know <laughs> what they're looking at. And I will include myself in there because yeah, I yeah, don't yeah, understand yeah. everything that was going on in those measurements. I understand some, probably enough just to be dangerous to myself and others. Right, right, right. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely something people are going to be... Uh, debating over without really knowing what they're talking about but nonetheless the objective measurements are there it's good he does put in comments that does he have any sort of up. uh uh hierarchy that he can uh you know her heuristical model or whatever they call it that he could compare the no you know the the this measurements from one to another I, or he just measure each yeah one? i didn't see like a, a table yeah. or something where you can easily do that i think you sort of have to go through each one i mean he takes similar measurements for each thing so at least you can compare that right. And it's all being yeah. done with the same test equipment. So at least there's that. But uh, in any case, we'll have a link well, I mean, to... the one thing I clicked on, like, randomly was uh, the Google phones, the Pixel 3s sure. are going to have the whatever the dongle, because everything's going to have a dongle yep, these yep, days, yep. for the headphone. And he was dreading having to do that. <laughs> so he figured out a way to plug into his computer and test it that right. way. And I'm like... Yeah. Introducing yeah. variables. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about that. I don't think <laughs> you should do it that way. I mean, I mean, it, it may make no difference, but then again, it may make a, yeah. a big difference. So I don't know. So anytime I see stuff like that, I'm like, and it's an engineer. Yes. That's an engineer thing. Yeah. And I, I, I don't mean this as any sort of slight. I just mean engineers solve problems. That's what they do. Yeah. He's like, it's going to take me forever to measure this thing using my phone. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do it that way. Is there an easier way to do it? Yes, I can measure it using this computer. It'll be a lot faster. Problem solved. Boom. And then, you know, <laughs> the, uh, and the statistician in the back is going, uh, hold, wait, what, hold on. <laughs> Hand slowly Extra raised. variable just got <laughs> added in there big time. Yeah. But anyway, we'll have yeah, but a that, link to uh, all of his reviews because there's he's got like his own sub page going on there over at Audio Science sure. Reviews Forum. So uh, yeah, we'll have. We're not really endorsing. Okay, I just want to say that we're not endorsing. This no, person, no, this is Nick are. who's recommending it. Uh, if yeah, you're looking yeah, we're for just passing it along, yeah, reviews of headphone DAX and amps that where you're not likely to find professional reviews of them anywhere else. At least it's something to what, go by. Anybody to take anything I just said as, as any sort of slight against the, the gentleman? Right, either. we are I mean, neutral. I, I, on this. I, I, neutral. I spent very, I spent a couple of seconds on his page and went, oh, "That was a weird thing," and <laughs> that was it. You know what I mean? <laughs> that, was, that was it. So I'm not I'm not making any sort of value judgment about. He could be the most accurate reviewer in the universe, as far as I know. So there you go. <laughs> Bobby, Bobby just wanted to send us a very nice email to let us to thank us for all the help that we provided his roughly 12 by 12 theater and occasional guest room. He hopes that we keep the podcast going for many more years to come and says he looks forward to listening every week. Are we shutting the podcast down? Is that well, the HT guys have been threatening <laughs> to shut down, so maybe that's caused the worry. You know, Home Theater Geeks got canceled. The HT guys are right, like, right. if you don't pay us enough, we're going away. So, <laughs> Wow. They didn't really say that, did they? In, in not so many words, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> They're like it has to I be financial. It has to be financially hope, reasonable to keep the podcast going when R is looking for a new job. So, that, I understand yeah, that. I, I, I mean, the guy is yeah. He's got he's got a family to feed. That's and right. And, and it's a lot of time and effort. Tough. Yeah. So I hope they keep going. But if they don't keep going, I think that makes us the longest running AV podcast. That would pretty probably sure. be the case. Yeah. I think that would be. I think we can now start putting that <laughs> at the bottom. That's our tagline. We survive. And if they come, if they come back, we'll just put continuous. <laughs> in like right. in a little. Well, a little we, we had a few months upper. hiatus there. When, when, uh... Nah, that doesn't count. <laughs> that doesn't count. That doesn't count. Uh, that was a sabbatical, not a cancellation. Oh, hey, I was traveling between countries. Give me right, a break. Yeah. And I was also extremely angry. All right, PJ wrote us a few weeks ago when he had some plumbing work done, so he had unplugged all of his theater gear, and then he when he he plugged his Denon X twenty two hundred W back in, his HDMI outputs were all completely dead, and he did a full factory reset. Did nothing to get it working again. We said it was time to call Denon, so he did. He sent it in for repair, but didn't hear anything for two weeks, so he started to get worried. Then, without any communication, he got back from work on Friday to find this FedEx guy waiting for him. Denon had sent him an X. Uh, 2400H to replace his broken 2200W. Yep. So the, the numbers went up, but the letters went down. <laughs> what are you going to do? So no idea what actually went wrong, but he's, but he's able to watch movies again, and now he can use the Odyssey Editor app. Not exactly great on the communication front, but a happy ending to the tale nonetheless. Yeah, I think that's sort of, you know, I, I mean, 
you're really saying it's with third party. Right. So Denon, Denon is just like saying, okay, we're going to send you this thing, fix it, or tell us that you can't, and then we'll send them another one. And the, you know, the, all the communication is going on probably almost automatically right. between Denon and this this third party thing. And no, they don't care that you don't know what's going <laughs> and on. And all in all, they it have... actually did go exactly as what they say will take place. Right. So, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. fair enough. If they tell you at the beginning, here's what's going to happen, and ultimately the result is that, um, yeah. then yeah, you can't really hold that against them. So, No, but, I mean, hey, you got a new receiver out of the that's whole right. thing. That's right. Uh, that's great. That was, refurb, model. Though, huh? that was a refurb. That was a refurb? Yeah. It, wasn't it a refurb? Uh, B-Stock, yeah. B-Stock. B-Stock, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that means good. they checked hey. it out, so. Yeah. And he, and he gets a new unit with a new warranty. That's right. So one year, but you know, one year manufacturer's warranty. So that's don't get uh, any more plumbing problems. All right, <laughs> Jared. Let's get started with the questions here. Jared says uh, his goal is to get the best audio quality he can. Let's begin by describing Jared's room. Now, everybody, buckle up because this is long. It, but it <laughs> requires it because it's an odd setup. So to understand what's happening, description required. Okay. From front to back, the room is about 16 feet long. It's about 15 and a half feet wide, but the back of the room is a bit narrow, narrower since there's a jut in for the front door. So the front of the room is 15 and a half feet wide and 10 feet long, and the back of the room is 12 feet wide and the remaining 6 feet. Remember, 16 feet total yeah. in the longness. So uh, the back is a little bit in. So I guess it's in on one side, I would imagine. But yeah, it's in on the right-hand side. That's where the front door comes in, so... Okay, so there's a window on the right wall, and the front door is on the right side at the back of the room. Okay, so on the right wall in the back of the room, there's a door. On the right wall at the front of the room, there's near the front of the room, there is a window. Correct. Okay, then there's stairs going upstairs uh, on the back wall next to the front door. So you walk in the front door, you turn left, and there's going to be stairs. Correct. I'm guessing. Okay, and then there's some pictures here that nobody can see but me, <laughs> and then I scroll. Okay, on the left wall at the back... On the left wall near the back is an open doorway into the kitchen. And then on the left wall at the front is another open doorway also into the kitchen. So there's two doorways into the kitchen. That's They're right. both open. So it's a left wall with openings to the front and the back to the, into the kitchen. There's a fish tank on that left wall as well. I guess in, not in, in between the doors. Correct. Yes. Or the openings. They're really not doors or openings. So they've got kids and pets. So since they the only way to get to the front of the room is via the doorway... Uh, get to the front of the room is via the doorway to the kitchen they've got a wicker room uh room divider to keep their dogs from getting into the front portion so this is the front of the room so the front portion the front opening is is closed off by a very permeable wicker that's right stand yeah. thing so it's okay. it's not uh, uh like blocking the air movement whatsoever this is in no way closing off the open doorway in terms of air right. movement and sound movement. But no, it's no. a physical no. barrier to keep the dogs out of the front of the room and knocking over speakers. Okay. The couch goes across the room, and it's just in front of the front door. And there are dual subwoofers, SVS, SB13 Ultras, to either side of the couch. So there's no way to walk from the back portion of the room to the front portion of the room unless you climb over the back of the couch. <laughs> uh, you have to walk from the front door into the kitchen and then come through the opening to the kitchen past the wicker thingy, into the front of the room to get to the seats of the couch. So that's how the wicker thing works. Yep. So right? if you came so in the, the front door, you'd walk straight ahead into the kitchen, go through the kitchen yeah. into the other kitchen entrance, and that would get you back into the front of the living room because there's subwoofers on either side of the couch completely blocking the walkway. <laughs> All right. Everybody got it? These dogs must be tiny. They can't get over these subs, but whatever. Jared has a ton of bookshelf, uh, bookcase shelves to hold his many, many, and there's only two many's, but I'm going to add many, 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 Many DVD and video game cases. There are shelves, shelving cases on all, all four walls anywhere there isn't a doorway or a window. He, got, he has also made or modified a bunch of absorption panels and base traps. The front uh, wall has two inch thick insulation with a three and a half inch gear, air gap behind it. Then the TV and speakers are in front of that, giving him about an eight and a half foot viewing distance. The back wall has two inch thick insulation with a five inch air gap behind it. And the upper edge uh, where the left wall meets the ceiling has a two foot by six foot panel straddling the upper edge where the left wall meets the ceiling. So straddling that mm -hmm. corner with four inch thick insulation inside and the upper edge uh, where the right wall meets the ceiling above the window has a one foot by eight foot panel straddling it also with four inch thick insulation so he's got about as much as you can possibly get and he's not even done then he has two real trap 
triatraps, which are tetrahedron tetrahedron drawns in shape. They're triangles, triangle basically. pyramids, but they yes. pyramids, and you stick you, you stick them into a corner, mm-hmm. right? So one of those is in the upper right corner, created by the jet in for the front door. The second tri trap is on the front wall on the other side of the opening, so it's actually in the kitchen. That's right. Okay. So, so, so. Man, oh man. <laughs> so, all right. So if you guys don't have a perfect mental pi- picture of that, welcome to the club. I have no idea what this I got. But you I'm can see at actual pictures. pictures that were taken if you come to youtube.com slash AV Rant and Not look at today. the completed two-hour video version. Not today, you can't, because right now all you're seeing is Not Fearless live. Mobile Climbing logo, right. talking to AV Rant logo. Uh, all right, Google. so fun times. Um, let's see here. Okay, but, but, but I have to scroll back down because yep. I was looking at the pictures. Okay. So Jared likes to build stuff. He wants to know if adding any more absorption will be beneficial. There aren't many open wall spaces left, and he doesn't really want any panels on the ceiling. Dude, you kind of already got them on the ceiling, but whatever. <laughs> Although he's willing if pa- ceiling panels will make a big improvement. So what do we think? Should he add more panels? And if so, where? Jesus Christ, dude. There's like no room left in this room. There's like this room is making me claustrophobic. Also, I really, I really don't think you need I, I don't think so. Because I don't this, think so is, this is not a every surface in here is hard and flat and reflective. In fact, every surface in here is irregular. Because every surface yeah. in here, if it's not a window or an opening or the carpet, you want a fun project? Take those DVDs and randomly pull some and pull, pull some of them I out. Guess. You know, That'll so make that, it even more so diffuse. You, but <laughs> that would make a, a giant diffuser. That's right. Everything. But I mean, what what we're mostly worried about in rooms are continuous, hard, flat surfaces right. because those are highly reflective and they give strong reflections that are not you know, scattered in any way. Right. And, and right, right, that right. means that it could quite easily interfere with the direct sound going from the speakers to your ears. In your situation, you got an irregularly shaped room to begin with, and then you've got irregular surfaces all over your walls. That means yeah. you probably don't even need as many panels as you already have, although that's not likely to hurt anything. But Right. That's what actually I was thinking. When I right. first saw this, I was like, I mean... I think you're kind of okay. Not only are you okay, you probably lose a panel or two and you probably wouldn't know this yeah. the difference too much. Yeah. But because, uh, I mean, the kitchen ends up being a base trap anyways. You yep. know, just Plus upstairs. Up I don't so. know if there's a door at the top of those stairs or not. but I, I would mean, assume that there's not. Yeah, air can yeah, just so. move freely up that stairwell as well. Yeah. Uh, no, you you are not a candidate for where we would be saying, oh, you've got to add more absorption here. I, I think you're fine <laughs> already. You're probably more than you need. Uh, but I think if- this more than anything uh, it should in- indicate to listeners that our, you know, we have no motto. We have no agenda mantra. we have no <laughs> agenda we are in no way like in order to fix things you must do this one thing mm. like that that's just it, it, that's just when you go to somebody who sells cables they're like yep. cables can fix everything <laughs> we like are, what's we wrong with my room tell hammer. me your problem <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> tell me your problem, and I will tell you the cable that will fix it. And right. we're like, the, even the thing that we mostly say around here, which is you need more absorption, you need more absorption, you need more absorption. We get to this guy, we're like, nah, dude, you can Not back your off, case. you're good. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want a more objective take on it, because uh, uh, coming up later, he actually already owns a U-Mic 1. Um, so you already have the measurement microphone on hand, and I'm assuming you have okay. a computer of some sort, and Room EQ Wizard is free. So what you <laughs> could do... Find it but it's in there someplace. Yeah, what what <laughs> you could do ones. is um, play some... Uh, so you'd want to play short chirps. You'd yeah. want to do a, a short chirp out of one speaker at a time. And what you're looking for is the waterfall plot to see how long it takes for the sound to decay. And you could do a, a very short uh, sweep chirp, you know, where it's actually like, right. like kind of what Odyssey does, right? That, that sweep chirp that it makes. And you would look at the waterfall plot in Room EQ Wizard. And what you're hoping to see is uh, generally fairly short decay times, but also Mm -hmm. that you would expect to see the decay times getting longer and longer as the frequency gets lower and lower. And that's just because the wavelength of those frequencies is longer to begin with. It takes that much longer for the wave to to even form, so therefore it takes Mm -hmm. a little bit longer for the wave to decay as well. But you want to see that as a 
is a generally smooth increase in decay times from your high frequencies down to your low frequencies. You don't want to see uh, a lot of irregularities, you know, where some of the high frequencies take a long time to decay and others are very, very short. And then some of the base frequencies take a long time to decay and others are very, very short. You want it to be a, a gradual increase in decay times. So that would be a more would, objective way to look at it. Yeah, I would venture to, to guess that he has exactly what he's going to find. Right. My, b by yeah. rule of thumb and just looking at it, I go, you're probably very, very okay right now. Yeah. So again, his goal is to just get the best audio quality possible. His speakers are Clips Reference 2 series up front. The center is pushed back on the stand so it won't be knocked over by kids or pets. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the surround this round back speakers are, are from an Onkyo home theater in the box. The receiver is Onkyo 818. So is there anything in terms of his speakers or receiver they should do in order to get the best sound? Yeah, upgrade everything. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Well, hey, I don't mean that in a bad way. On absorption panels, so I, I guess. I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm saying that this guy is literally like prime candidate for getting like better speakers and us not having to say things like, right. okay, but if you get them and you don't do this, this, and this, you, you know, your room's going to mess them up. And right, yeah, get, yeah. Your room you're is get. not the limiting factor. We're yeah. not saying that the first thing you need to do is treat this room. You've already treated the room. Perfectly a, can, a great candidate for room correction, like uh, yeah. Drac or uh, Odyssey. But he already has multi qxd 32 with an Onkyo 818, so. Right, well, uh, and... Really, the the speakers for me, I mean, especially the home theater box surrounds are probably mm. just fine. They're probably I just yes. I mean, that could, but that could, I mean, home theater box speakers that could definitely be an upgrade to be had there. But you know, yeah. But I think if you're going to do less... this, I think you do the whole thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm looking at this front sound stage, and I'm like, those. I mean, I have, I, I have zero problem with the clips reference to speakers in an overall sense, but. For this listening distance, which is quite close, what do you say, about eight and a half yeah. feet, you do not need the efficiency. Is... <laughs> and it looks as though you're essentially, like, these are where they can be physically, not necessarily where they would be optimally. Right. Um, so, honestly... They definitely could be wider, for sure. Yeah, the front, left, and right... They're really, only, they're, really only, they're really only servicing the, first, the, the two middle chairs. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah. that ideally, having that center, we wouldn't have it pushed back like that because you're getting a strong reflection off the top of and the I have, equipment cap. I have some issue with that that statement that he has it pushed back so the animals and the kids don't knock it over. First of right. all, it's on top of a table. Yeah. How is having it that far back? And, and you, I mean, if they're going to knock it over, they're going to knock it over from there, too. I mean, push it all, at least so that the front, but, you know, the front uh, of the speaker is Even in with line the with the front. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. I, I just don't see why. I mean, maybe the, the I mean that cat it looks. I guess maybe if the massive. when the dogs get in there, maybe their paws go up on the front of that table. If they if they have Danes or something like that right. too, Danes could you know they are their tails are right there yeah, at yeah, that yeah. level and they can knock stuff over. They're real strong too when they're full grown. So that could be an issue. So I'm not saying that, but I gotta believe you can pull that thing forward. A little but I mean, bit. I, I but I this would is, consider different speakers all around. Yeah, I think so. That's yeah. I think that's, so. That's something that could be a consideration. So obviously, that's a whole other budget that might not be in the cards right now. But you're asking, is there something you could do to improve the sound? And honestly, you could replace all the speakers that you own. You don't have to yeah. by any means, but you could. I would be looking at bookshelf speakers. I mean, you're sitting yeah, super close, sure. dude. I would get get the money that you're going to save in yeah. How much in in, in a tower speaker? Buy by book by the bookshelf, your performance can go up quite a bit. And I mean, if and you, you like, like to mix that, stuff anyways, you make the stands. That's the zero yeah. money out of your pocket practically. So you know, I I think that book like some nice quality bookshelf speakers are perfect. I mean, if yeah. you like that uh, efficiency and horn loaded type sound, you could definitely look at HSU speakers. Uh, that that would be a consideration. Yeah. I, I mean, he doesn't need the efficiency, so I think no, if he, he just likes he that he, style though. Yeah, I mean, yeah. All right. I don't, I don't like the HSUs. All right. Without getting to subwoofers just yet, overall, what can you do in, in here in terms of absorption panels and speakers to optimize this audio quality? Should you consider adding diffusion panels? Dude, your room is a diffusion panel. Should he should he stuff any air gaps with pink insulation if he wants maximum base absorption? Nope. Should he fill any of the air gaps around his surround speakers in his bookcases with insulation? 
I mean, you could. Yeah. Would it's, such little bits of insulation even make a difference? Nope. Nope. <laughs> I mean, you could do any or all of this, and you'd be like, afterwards, you were like, whoo, I'm hot and sweaty. I'm going to go listen to something and hear the big difference I just made. And you'd be like, hmm, nope. I mean, like I said, if you really want to be, if you really want more diffusion in this place, just go there and just move some of the DVDs right. in. Have, have them DVDs have out. none of their backs yeah. even with each other. Even. It's going to look right. odd, but yeah. I guess there's that. Hey, there's already, there's already, you have to, you've made like a little, you know, fort yeah. here on the subwoofers and couch. So he's already looking a yeah, little no, the, odd. The biggest but. change you could make in here now would be actually changing your speakers. That is yeah, the, I mean, that is the biggest change you could make now. Yeah, I don't see anything else that you could do in this room. I mean, yeah. if you want the only the only issue that I might see is if you push your speakers out wider, mm-hmm. so that you know it encompasses the whole couch. That that right speaker would be nearer to that wall, and then you might want to have like a literally a panel that you would just lean up next to the next to the DVDs. window. Yeah, yeah, right there, and that would be that uh, absolute only thing i think I that you would want to do to this room i mean i don't see any reason to put anything on your ceiling i don't see no. any reason to add any absorption no you definitely don't need to add any diffusion nope you got bookcases everywhere <laughs> so subwoofers he says he's got a pair of svs sb13 ultras on the side of his couch they're on top of a sub i'm sorry on top of subdued isolation risers he's also got a mini dsp two by four and a you mic one mm-hmm. it's hard for him to access the back panel controls of his subs so can he use the mini dsp to make all the necessary adjustments he hasn't tried the trial and error process of adjusting phase just yet so when he's ready to do that can he do it via the mini dsp instead of having to adjust the phase knobs on the back of the svs subwoofers i think yes right for, uh, don't i think for yes? the most part yes though the one thing where they're a little bit more limited is that in the mini dsp um I believe it like it gives you a, a distance setting or or a delay setting, yeah, and yeah. it doesn't have a huge range on that. I think it actually only goes up to uh, seven and a half milliseconds, which is uh, a very small but, amount of adjustment yeah, yeah. to be made. Hmm. So okay. so yeah. Uh, other than that, I mean, you can definitely change uh, you know relative levels as far as the gain that's being sent out. You can do individualized EQ, which you can also do uh, as far as three bands of EQ could be built into the subs, but you can certainly do individualized EQ on the mini DSP itself. Yeah, it's really only the uh, delay adjustment where I don't think it has as much play. Um, mm. So if, if what it has is enough, then yes, you can basically do everything just in the mini DSP. Um, yeah. So if and when he does the phase adjustment thing, after he's done, if he makes any changes to the room, such as adding more shelves or absorption panels, will he need to do the trial and error phase adjustments all over again? The technical answer to that is yes. I suppose. The the the, the realistic answer is, I mean, you'd have to really make a change. Yeah. Dude. I mean, if you're talking about adding a little bit of absorption or, you know, a little bit of a panel. Uh, I mean, those aren't going to affect the... Cover deep... up a window with a bookshelf. I mean, I just... I don't see it. I don't see it making a huge Yeah, those aren't going to affect the deep base anyway. So uh, where you would definitely have to is if you moved your seats, like significantly, you know. Uh, Now you're in a... (laughs) literally no place else to put oh i know but i mean this, would, this is for, for would, everyone well, else if you did if you did right, move your seat right. significantly now you're in a completely different wave pattern part of the room if you significantly change the dimensions of your room like for example for all the people we tell to add a door if they had done this before adding the door and then they add a door well now you got to do it again because you have a completely different wave pattern in that room now just adding shelves or absorption panels those aren't affecting frequencies low enough that i would expect you right. to need to do this tom is correct in that if you want to be completely anal retentive about it then yes of course you could but i wouldn't expect that where we would expect to see large different results is when you are significantly changing the wave pattern of the base mm-hmm. in your room. And that would mean changing the dimensions of the room or changing where you are taking the measurements in the room. Yeah. See, most people have to, if they have a room that's basically bare and they set everything up uh-huh. and then they add, we're like, go buy absorption panels. And they run, they, they get a bunch of absorption panels to put them all over the room. Like, yes, now do it again. Because right. yeah. <laughs> because we have essentially, without actually changing the dimensions of the room, according from the sounds perspective, we have. 
yeah, by adding the absorption in the room, Even then, we have... probably only down to about 80 hertz, but that's significant that's enough true. that you would probably yeah. want to. But in this case, yeah. we're not suggesting yeah. you add a bunch more panels. So, yeah. You'd be, you'd be okay. In other words, you'd be okay to do it now because we don't anticipate that you're going to significantly move where your seat is or right. add solid doors anywhere or you know, add significant enough uh, absorption that it would actually affect the subwoofer signals. Right. So when he was level matching his two subwoofers, he had a single subwoofer output co signal coming out of his AV receiver to his mini DSP. He left the subwoofer trim level on his AV receiver at the default zero position, then he used the mini DSP to get each sub to read 75 dB individually. Mm -hmm. Then he ran Odyssey and set it uh, the subwoofer output trim level down a couple of dB so that the combined response of the two subs was at 75 dB. Is this okay? Is that the correct way to do level matching in his setup? That's perfectly fine. That's totally fine. Yeah. Uh, if again, if you want to be real anal about it, I would have done it so that uh, uh, the mini DSP had set it for like 73, sure. so that your trim level stays at yeah, zero. Yeah, 72 or 73. Yeah. Yeah, just so and that then the combined uh, is automatically at seventy five that way. And and the reason I would have done that is simply because if sometimes if you lower the trim level on your receiver, it it, it can cause like the output voltage to be just low enough that the, mm. the automatics turn on doesn't oh, happen. Yeah, Un yeah, yeah. Unlikely, unlikely to be an issue. Unlikely to be something that ever affects anything. But at the same time, I was like, okay, well. Yeah, and he certainly didn't say anything <laughs> like, oh, sometimes no sound is coming out of my SVS subs. Right, so right, right. right what right. you did in your setup is totally fine. Yeah. So he, uh, did I skip a question? No, G. Okay, yeah. He tried uh, applying some EQ to subwoofers used in the mean DSP. He found that after doing this, he had to increase the output level of the subs to get them back to reading 75 dB. Is that because the EQ was cutting some frequency, causing the overall output to level to drop a bit? Any issue with this? Um, I mean, I know. anytime that you make any sort of EQ or changes to your sub, you're always going to have to worry about, you know, rechecking the level matching and mm -hmm. making sure it's fine. You don't know exactly, you know, I mean, you do know because you made the changes yourself. So, uh, 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 assuming that you did, sometimes we, when people say, oh, I made changes, EQ, you, what you mean is you use Room EQ Wizard and it did the thing and then the thing was done and then it was fine. But, uh, yeah, you should always worry about. You should always go back and re-check uh, your subs volume levels. So yeah, no. What was described there way. sounds exactly like what we would expect because yeah. when you're yeah. um, looking for the overall, like when you're setting the trim level or the volume dial on your subwoofer, it's playing pink noise, so it's playing all the frequencies simultaneously. And taking that signal cumulatively and saying all of these frequencies playing at the same time equal 75 decibels of output. Now, if you go in there with an equalizer and you do what you should do, which is trim down any peaks as opposed to trying to fill in any large dips, that's exactly what you ought to do is cut down any large peaks. Then, yeah, when you go back right. and play all the frequencies cumulatively again, uh, the overall level might be a bit lower than before you applied that equalizer. It should so be totally huge. Makes, it yeah, should be huge, but he didn't describe huge. it as huge. Yeah. Like I had to tick it up a little bit so that it was back to 75 yeah. dB. That totally makes sense. Yeah. So what's the correct order for using the mini DSP's adjustments versus Odyssey? Should he do level, distance, and EQ adjustments all in the mini DSP first and then run Odyssey after all that? Or should he be making some adjustments in the mini DSP after Odyssey has been run. I would think that you would do the mini DSP stuff first and then the Odyssey stuff yeah, second. Yeah, Odyssey should be last with the one exception being if you really, really do not want Odyssey's final target curve to be your final result. Because that's true. the overarching idea yeah. of this is that what you're trying to achieve before running Odyssey is uniform base across all of the seats that you care about. Once you have that, now Odyssey can very effectively EQ it because it's getting the same response no matter where you measure. You've achieved uniformity prior to running Odyssey. So all the stuff you're doing in the mini DSP, and one thing that could help you would be that multi-sub optimization software. Again, you already have the measurement microphone, so you could give that a try. Even though you're only using two subs, you can still give it a try because what that'll do is spit out recommendations for what each individual sub should have as its level, delay, and EQ setting, which you can set in the mini DSP. So you've done that for each of your two subs individually in the mini DSP, which should result in nice uniform base across all of your seats. Then you run Odyssey and it can very effectively EQ it. But of course, the end result of that 
would be EQ, uh, Odyssey's EQ target curve. And if you really want something different, then you could go back in <laughs> to the Mini DSP and do whatever uh, alterations after the fact to get the target yeah. curve that you want. That's starting to get complicated. If you had one of the newer AV receivers that can use the Odyssey editor app, you could adjust the Odyssey's target curve in there. But with the Onkyo 818, you can't use the Odyssey editor app. So yeah, for most people, I would say Odyssey should be the last thing that you run. Yeah. So give us a budget, mm. <laughs> basically. Give us a budget of what you want to spend on speakers, and we will um, we'll help you buy speakers if you're looking to buy speakers. If you're not, enjoy what you have and save up. And then we, I mean, obviously the man cares about audio. So if you yes. care about audio, I mean, buying speakers should be an easy sell. <laughs> you know I mean? Right, right. <laughs> That's, uh, that should be. The, <laughs> but obviously the, more the, expensive just, than acoustic panels. So That is true. Yeah. Brandon. Brandon installed an Epson 4000 projector with a Seymour AV uh, center stage UF, which is the ultra fine, 109 inch screen. He surprised his wife with a surprise. <laughs> and even though she wasn't exactly thrilled at first, when once they watched the first movie, she had to admit it was pretty awesome. Uh, he's also got a 65 inch Vizio P series TV that's now behind the screen when it comes down. And his receiver is a Marantz SR 7011. He plugged the main HDMI output of his Marantz into his Vizio and the mirrored output uh, into the Epson. If the Vizio is off and the Epson is on, everything works fine. But if the Epson is off and the Vizio is on, sources cut in and out, seemingly trying to handshake over and over. <laughs> or in the case of his Apple TV, it just goes black. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So which one's the mirrored one? The Epson is the, the mirrored Epson one. The Epson is on the mirrored so, output. Yeah, yeah. Is there a solution for this? They only use the Epson for movies, so it's not the absolute end uh, end of the world to plug and unplug it. But obviously, that's a bit inconvenient, and isn't exact. Uh, and isn't this exactly exact setup the whole point of multiple HDMI outputs on the Marantz? Any way to get this working? Uh, sometimes the uh, the idea of these outputs on the Marantz, well, these dual HDMI outputs is ones for audio, ones for mm. video, ones for Zone 2 or something well, like that. Well, the too. Zone 2, but, yeah, because th that AV receiver, the 7011, it actually has three HDMI outputs. Two of them are mirrored, but the third one is an independent Zone 2 HDMI output, and that could be the thing that helps you here. Yeah, just yeah. go ahead and plug the Epson into the Zone 2. Into the Zone 2. Zone 2. Yeah. yeah. That seems like that would be a pretty good solution. Yeah, because you're not having to buy anything. And it is it's it is a few more button prices, but you could actually set up a macro to do that if you have a Harmony yeah, or sure. something like that. And so what you would do is you would still have the Vizio television connected to the main HDMI output. Because now, when you have Zone 2 turned off, the Marantz doesn't see the Epson at all. So that should work. Right. Right, So now zone two is turned off. It doesn't see the Epson at all. So it's just sending things out to the Vizio. That should work fine. Then you said when the Vizio TV is off, but the Epson is on, that's okay. So when you turn zone two on, so that now the signal is being set to the Epson, but the Vizio television itself is turned off, that shouldn't create a conflict. What you will need to do is make sure that your sources are set to output to both the main zone and to zone two because you're still getting the audio from the main zone, but you're right. sending the video to zone two. So as long as your source is set to output to both the main zone and zone two, you'll get the audio in, in the main zone and you'll get the video coming out of the zone two HDMI output being set to your Epson, but that's fine. And then when you're not using the Epson, you just turn zone two off entirely and now everything just goes to your Vizio in the main zone. So that should work. Fingers crossed. Emphasis on should. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. Lots of things should work I around here. I am not and guaranteeing <laughs> that at all. But yeah, I mean, this is kind of the reverse of what we might expect. Often we expect the that when the projector is off, it's completely off, and it's the television that's like pseudo on, you know, because it's in standby, yeah, no, ready yeah. to go. But in this case, it happens to be the reverse. When the Vizio is in standby, everything is fine. But when the Epson is in standby, apparently there's still enough of a signal that it's like, I can't handshake with both of you. Oh, HDMI. So if he's using his Apple TV, it seems one to be set up for a new video output every time he switches between which display he's using. <laughs> Is there a way to get the Apple TV to stick to one video setting output or auto switching depending on wh whether he's using the Vizio uh, or the Epson or auto switch? 
depending on whether he's using the video. In other words, um, remember. Remember. Aesthetic. Remember. Yeah, Remembering is not something that these things do very well. Nope. But uh, it seems like there should be like a force it to output one thing thing. Isn't there in there? I thought that, that, <laughs> I, I thought I don't... that they were adding that. I don't know. I don't have an Apple TV on hand to test firsthand, so I I don't know. Uh, the Nvidia Shield it lets you do that. That's the one. That, yeah. That's the one that doesn't auto switch when you want it to. So it's the reverse <laughs> problem. Um, uh, welcome to. Yeah. yeah, I don't. I don't yeah. know. This seems like a highly likely thing, right? Like it's like, oh, the Apple TV is like, oh, I'm it connected to a different display. This now, you know, you turn the Epson on, new display, set me up again. Yeah, doesn't doesn't shock me that that's what it does. Isn't that? Yeah. Yeah, that's why you know Apple makes it so that you know anybody can use it. It just it just works, right? It just works. Um, it just works in such a way as to make you want to pull your hair out, but it just works. So I mean, the, the full answer is I don't know because I haven't actually tested this scenario firsthand since I don't have an Apple TV on hand. Uh, I guess you're doing the the setup procedure every time you switch between displays. God, that is a hassle. But what else can you do besides buying a second Apple TV? Right. That might be that might be an option. <laughs> I guess. If you got if you got money burning a hole in your pocket, like this Apple TV is for the Vizio. How much is how much are those Apple things? Uh, $180. Maybe I'm $180 for that thing. I know. Or maybe that's yeah, Canadian. It might be 150 in the States. I'm not sure. Yeah, whatever. So the Epson 4000 is limited to uh, 4K24 if the movie is in HDR. Rob mentioned that the new 4010 that replaces the 4000 in Epson's lineup has a full 18 gigabits per second HDMI inputs for 4K60 support. But this is correct. Everything Brandon has read about the new 4010 says it's still limited to 4K24 with HDR. Are you questioning Rob? As well he should because I was wrong. I was oh. dead wrong. Well, at least from the information. Rob, you have failed us for the last I time. Know, from the information I found, which is probably the same information Brandon found. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, other than, so they're they're calling their new wobble procedure a different name. And apparently it's it's oh, wobbling yeah. slightly differently. Like this is kind of how, like how every year JVC has a new number for E-Shift, right? So Epson also makes little alterations to how they wobble their panels. So apparently they're they're wobbling it in a in a slightly new procedure and they're calling that uh, I don't know, Pro UHD or something or other is the, the copyright name they gave to it. In any case, that appears to be the only difference between the 4000 and the 4010 because everything oh, really? else in the manuals and in the specs is identical. So why do we think that there, there it was... Because changed. the replacement for the 5040 has the 18 oh. gigabits per second. So I I made the poor assumption that since they did it to the 5040's replacement, which we're expecting will be called the 5050, since that one got upgraded HDMI inputs, and that is for sure listed in the table, uh, oh. I assumed they'd do the same thing for the 4000's replacement, but I was dead wrong about that. The 4010 appears to be exactly the same as the 4000. So still limited. So the Eps... The Epson 4000 does not automatically switch picture modes when you switch between HDR and SDR. You have to manually switch picture modes. We've talked about that on this podcast yeah, before. Yeah. Any chance it might ever get a firmware update so that it switches automatically? Or does the new 4010, excuse me, have automatic picture mode switching for HDR versus SDR? Uh, any chance, there is always a chance. Right. I think it's a very, very If it happened, chance. I wouldn't like say the world has ended and the impossible has occurred. It could... That's that's not. I would not. The betting man, the smart money is on not. Right. Yeah. Yes, it is not utterly inconceivable and impossible, but I wouldn't hold my breath for it. Especially since the forty ten seems to be the four thousand. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, I mean the the forty ten. By everything I could read about the forty ten, doesn't make any mention of automatically (laughs) switching picture modes. It still it still gives you the same troubleshooting error for. I just put an HDR signal. It doesn't look HDR. They're like, well, manually turn on the HDR mode. So that's still in there in the forty ten's instructions. So I don't think anything changed. So, I, if anything, that gives me more hope that they might actually add some firmware to to fix this. But because if fixing one would uh-huh. fix the other one as well, but the fact that they haven't already fixed it yeah. tells me they're not gonna fix it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Wouldn't hold my breath on that yeah. one. Brandon needed a 50-foot HDMI cable for the projector, and he went for a monoprice fiber optic HDMI cable. Is that still the top recommendation, or could an active HDMI cable work as uh, just as well at 50 feet? Isn't the fiber optic cable active? I thought that was active. 
Well, I mean, it, but we're we're making the differentiation between a passive copper cable, which is the normal HDMI cable, and active copper cable, which you know has the directional thing, and you have to plug the correct end into the correct right, 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 right. device, and then a fiber optic cable, which yes is I mean, active, so but. Could you could you have a copper cable that that is active that works just as well? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. fifty feet is right about the cutoff, right? That's right uh, where I'm like, much, yeah, uh, maybe yeah. go fiber optic, right? Uh, but yeah. Blue Jeans cable, they do sell in their Series Three active HDMI cables, which are copper. They do sell a fifty footer, and I would trust that. Um, you know, if Blue Jeans cable sells it, I, I trust it basically. So they yeah, do have a 50 footer that is active, but, um, honestly going with the fiber, cheap. I mean, <laughs> I guess he's thinking he could return it and save money, right. By going with the active, which is true. Is that true? Yeah. The 50 foot cable from Blue Jeans is cheaper than the, than the fiber optic. Fiber optic. Yeah. Wow. The fiber optics are, are kind of pricey. So yeah, hmm. you, if, if this is about, you could still return the fiber optic and get an active uh, copper HDMI one instead uh, to save some money. Uh, I would I would give that an okay thumbs up, but you are right on that borderline. So yeah, he read an article somewhere claiming fiber optic HDMI cables provide better picture quality even at shorter lengths. Is any truth to this? Nope. Nope. <laughs> Not even a little bit. Nope. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did the ones and zeros get there? Did the ones and zeros <laughs> get they there not? better? Yeah. <laughs> It's, well, it's because it's light, Rob. Hmm. Light is what we see coming out of displays, and light is what's transporting the ones and the zeros. Therefore, the the ones and zeros are more illuminated, Rob. Mm -hmm. It's just science. You know what happens in binary digital? Man, this one and zero barely got here, but they got there. Yep, yep, then it's perfect. <laughs> yeah. But it's lighter, Rob. Mm. Stop it. You're not you're not thinking scientifically, right? Andrew on Facebook. Andrew has Philips Hue lighting and uses the Apple Home app to control and automate them. What other home automation items should he consider adding to his home theater setup? A Harmony Hub, uh, Amazon Echo device, an Ecopy. Uh, none of the above. Oh, well, <laughs> Harmony yeah. Hub for sure. Get a the, all hub. of uh, all of them. All of them are work. All of them yeah. technically can work with what you're talking about here, and I think it's it's you know it, it, it implementation for me has been very 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 spotty. So uh, if you're really into um, doing this sort of stuff, you should get on, get into like the Z was it the Z Wave stuff yeah. and all that. Z Wave or Insteon, those are the probably the safest bets. But I mean, he's already and, dipped his toe into Apple, so you could look right. at things that are all Apple Home Kit. Okay. But, uh, uh, well, the Harmony Hub definitely is something that you could do, yes. uh, and then uh, the Amazon the Amazon will work with with uh, the Apple and all that stuff. Uh, will, will well, Echo, I don't know if the Echo, Echo will work with the HomeKit, but the Echo will work with the Harmony Hub, and the Harmony sure, Hub in right. turn will work with. I mean, it'll definitely work with your Philips Hue lights, but it'll also work with a ton of other home automation devices. So you might end up stepping away from HomeKit if you want to get more into your Amazon right. Echo doing all your voice control via your Harmony Hub, which is a possibility. Right. No? Yeah. Um, I mean, you get stuff that opens and closes your drapes, lowers your screen. Yes. If you have a screen. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, one other thing that might be very nice is uh, Lutron has some great uh, motorized shades, window shades. Sure. Uh, so the Serena shades in particular, those work with HomeKit. If you want to stay in HomeKit, they will also work with the Harmony Hub. That'll let them be controlled by that. So um, yeah, you could definitely set up a scene with your Harmony Hub where you tell uh, she who shall not be named, uh, start my, you know, watch a movie activity. And it turns on your TV and it sets the lights to the level that you want and it lowers your Lutron Serena shades and, you know, powers up your AV receiver and does all of that as part of the activities. So that's that's kind of cool. Um, the main thing I would recommend, since I'm certainly not a home automation expert, is check out the Home On podcast over at the Digital Media Zone. That's uh, Richard Gunther, who is a home automation expert. And you probably mm -hmm. already know about it, but on the chance that you don't or that other listeners aren't aware of it, Home On Podcast is fantastic for home automation stuff. Yeah, those guys know their stuff. Oh, yeah. So Andrew wants some gear lust. If each of us, Tom and Rob, had $25,000 to spend on a full home theater setup, what would we get? First of all, 
gear lust and twenty five thousand dollars for an entire setup mm. do not go hand in hand. You still got to be careful. Close. I mean, you yeah. can get some. You can get some nice stuff, but you still this yeah, isn't, absolutely. This isn't sky's the limit by any means. No. I know Rob's got a big list of stuff. I got nothing. I got so a go list. On. All right. Go on. So uh, he he said to like include seating. So okay, I'll include seating. Uh, I'd get some from uh, HT Market. They're HT Design recliners. Uh, I'm gonna say I'm gonna get it four of them. So that's twenty eight hundred bucks for the model that I like. It's about seven hundred bucks a piece. Um, I'd spend four thousand dollars on a projector. I'd get the JVC X seven ninety. That's a wobble K model, and I'm okay with the handshakes taking a long time. I'm I'm all right with that. I'd get a Seymour AV screen. Uh, I'd want one that has masking, so that's going to be thirty three hundred bucks. Um, I'd go whole hog in an AV receiver. Frame? That uh, no, that'd frame? be that'd be a drop down because actually the the motorized masking fixed frame is more expensive, so I'm I'm getting the drop down one. Oh okay. With uh, with Mazin, that's thirty three hundred bucks. That would be it for a nice hundred and thirty five inch or hundred and thirty seven in Seymour's case diagonal screen size. Uh, I'm going whole hog on a Navy receiver. I'm going to get a Denon X eighty five hundred H, and I can get that from Accessories for Less for three thousand dollars. So I'm cheating a little there, <laughs> saving a thousand bucks. Um, I'm going to assume I have a, a nice sized room, and I'm going to go killer on the subwoofers because why not? So some dual SVS PC four thousands basically what I have already in PC 13 Ultras, but I like those. That's $3,400 for a pair of those. Uh, I, I love the speakers I have now. I'd get them again if I had this budget. So that's going to be Ascend Acoustics, uh, Horizon Rowl speakers across the front, three of those. I'm going to keep front wides because I got myself an X8500H. So that's a pair of Sierra 2s to do that. And then I'd use uh, Sierra Lunas. They're on wall models as my surrounds and surround backs. So um, yeah, all of those together, those seven speakers or nine speakers rather is about $7,500. And uh, then to save money, because I need to, even with a $25,000 budget, I'll get two pairs of the Focal Bird speakers to mount on my ceiling for Atmos. So that's 600 bucks for those. Only from four plus. overhead speakers, Rob. How you to live with yourself uh, i'll be just fine i only got four recliners so that's not two rows and uh that leaves me 150 <laughs> bucks plus another 200 dollars. so 150 bucks i'll get myself a harmony companion to control it all and the other 200 dollars i'm spending on cables and i might just slip in at twenty five thousand dollars with that i'm done there you go good all right let's go on i got like i said i i i didn't have time to come up with anything <laughs> and honestly i'll be i don't like to shop you know, Rob's Rob has got a lot of the stuff still kind of in his head because yep. he's thinking like I I right now I love just about everything about my home theater. I would in a heartbeat change my speakers, and in a, I would definitely upgrade my uh, projector to a 4K. Sure, but other than that, like I love my couches, I love my subs, I love the amount of room treatments I have in here. You know, I would oh I. I would spend money and get a the world's shortest ceiling fan with a light in it, so I could. Because right now my my screen's a little bit too low because right. I got to shoot underneath the stupid ceiling fan. fan. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I would buy. That would be a twenty five thousand dollars ceiling fan. And just add it to what I had. I would really want to go. I would really spend six months just listening to speakers. Hmm. I almost guarantee you, I would do that. I would not. I been. I I think I'd probably spend the most on that out of anything. All right, this is from Tom, who lives in Prague. So exciting. The never that I know of had a question from Prague, so here we go. Mm -hmm. Prague has a challenge. I'm sorry, Tom has a <laughs> challenge. His name's not Prague. He lives in Prague. Tom has a challenge. His living room is open concept. The area where he has his TV is roughly 14 feet by 16 feet. But then it's open on the right to a 15 foot by 33 foot space for the kitchen and dining room. Then all that is open to a hallway. Also, the ceilings are 10 and a half feet tall. Yep. Despite the open concept, he has a very limited space for speakers due to built-in cabinets and doorway placement, as well as uh, where cables have to be run, which lead back to an, an AV rack where all the gear is already set up. So the available space for the subwoofer needs to go is only 13 inches deep, 11 inches wide, and 28 inches tall. That's tiny. That's not big enough for... Uh pc something no uh furthermore he like he'd really like the subwoofer to be glossy white you can't have it all <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say yeah. hi, hi how are you with paint because <laughs> you're gonna have to yeah you might have to custom get this guy uh he know he never be able to pressurize the space ain't that the truth not with that but size. could we re yeah, no, no. could we recommend anything that would fit all of these constraints he found the dolly phase sub one 
and Dolly is a speaker manufacturer, which I have recommended in the mm-hmm. past, uh, though I have not recommended every speaker they've ever made. I have, I think it's not like a unilateral thing. Uh, but the, the subwoofer he's talking about, the Phazon Sub 1, it's 9 inches by 10 by 10 with a 6.5 inch driver. Should he get that or is there something else? Do just about anything else. Be better than I that. mean, that's but really it, not even a subwoofer. That, that's, that's not even a subwoofer. That's, that's... That is a base module. Yeah. That is, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, the space that he's actually sitting in, and let's just let's just address that really okay. quick first. So, he is. Uh, he didn't really tell us. He. Well, I mean, like fourteen by sixteen by ten and a half is the the area, yeah. but then it's open to a whole fifteen by thirty three by ten and a half, right, right. plus a hallway. So for your speakers themselves, you know, the fact that you're sitting fairly close to all of them means that you don't have to worry so much about the size of your speakers as far as, you know, being able to pressurize the whole space or, you know, being that For the loud. direct sound uh, from the speakers to your speakers. For the ears, direct sound right. from the speakers, yes. So, you know, I, I just want to first of all put that out there. You know, you're sitting probably sitting within 10, 10 feet of your speakers anyways. So... Most of the time, most speakers will be able to do just fine in your little space. Mm -hmm. Now, the subwoofer is going to be a bit of a challenge. We've said this many times on this podcast before. You can have small, you can have uh, low or loud or whatever, uh, and you can have cheap. Pick two. Right. (laughs) Because you can't have... All three of those things. You can't have it small and la- and you know low, loud, and cheap. They don't all go together. And in this so case, you we're talking need s- loud <laughs> and small. Yeah. So you you don't get cheap. Right. <laughs> you also don't get white. I hate to say it to but you. But I mean, in this case, we're talking so small that it you, is you small. just can't get super deep. It's just it's no. just impossible with this size constraint. Yeah. But you can get not utterly terrible. Although it's still going to be yeah. kind of expensive, yeah, yeah. So, so what you got, Rob? Uh, I mean, the only sub I would recommend in this case would be from JL Audio, and uh, right, sure. they have they have their Dominion series, which is actually below their E series. Uh, but that's the okay. only that's the only series that has a model that will physically fit into the size he's got, and it would be their D one hundred eight. Uh, that so that's as the name implies, that's an eight inch driver, better than the six and a half inch driver in the Dali. Um, it does only come in glossy black, as far as I'm aware. Uh, I believe some of their other subs are available in glossy white, but I haven't seen any mention of the Dominion subs coming in glossy white. Uh, but I mean, at least this thing gets you to a little bit below 30 hertz, as far as its extension goes. Uh, it right. is a, an 8-inch sealed design, as you know, all JL Audio home, uh, home subwoofers are sealed designs. Uh, but right. I mean, you know, like JL Audio always does a monster amplifier in this thing, and crazy excursion. Right. So... I mean, that's... How, how tall is it? How tall is it? So this one is only 11 inches tall, so you could get two of them and stack it if you I was going to say, allows. get two. Stack yeah. them. That's exactly what I was thinking. Yes, oh, yeah. get two. You know, it's, te- it's you 10 can. inches wide, so that'll fit into your 11-inch wide space. It's with its grill on, it's a hair over 13 inches deep. But if you took the grill off, it is 13 inches deep. So you said it has to fit 13 inches deep take the grill off it'll fit and it's only 11 inches tall so you could actually get two of them and stack them if budget allows but it's not a right. not a cheap sub but i mean that, that's how the only one i would recommend to you do we know yeah um, i agree with you. yeah but i'm not sure how JL much audio it cost over there so, yeah yeah do we know how much it costs here just for uh, i'd have to look it up but uh, give me a moment on right, that. so there's very few companies that make very small very good subs and jl audio is by far the best of them yes so whenever we think uh, whenever i think of a small sub jl audio is almost certainly the the subwoofer manufacturer that i look to now that does not preclude you from looking for other subs and if you really want that dolly man act yourself i don't care i guess so i mean but this is going to be better (laughs) okay that that, that's the the long and the short of it this is going to be i think quite a bit better than that right the 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 teeny tiny d108 uh, suggested retail price is nine hundred U.S. dollars. Yeah. yeah, for an eight-inch sealed sub, that's expensive. But I mean, not yeah. utterly out of the reach of possibility. I mean, if this is the only thing that'll fit, it could be worth spending that amount. Right. Well, I mean, two of them, how, eighteen hundred dollars. I mean, are you absolutely sure it has to be this size? I know. I mean, right? there's just no nothing else in this you room. Put a cylinder. I mean, we can literally else? save you. Yeah. We could get you a lot more base for a lot less money yeah. with just a few more inches all the way around this thing. You sure you can't squeeze a little, you know, scoot a piece of pottery 16 over? 16 inch or diameter cylinder. That 
you know? I mean, it won't fit in this space that he described, but if there's anywhere else in this room that you could put a 16-inch diameter cylinder, you can get an SVS cylinder sub, and that'll be a lot less expensive and play a lot lower and a lot louder. Right. So next he has a dedicated home theater room, 14 and a half feet by 19 feet. He can totally black out the room and watch a movie, but he'd like to have... Uh, be able to have some lights on when watching sports or when playing cards with the projector uh, and the projector is on in the background. So he's considering an ambient light rejecting screen. He read through a Projector Central's ALR screen comparison. And it seems as though either the Elite Screen's Dark Star 9 or the Screen Innovation's Black Diamond 1.4 would be the best options based on that article. He wouldn't want a visible texture on the screen when he's watching movies in pitch blackness. And it's more important in his setup to, uh, to reject light that's coming from overhead rather than from the side he wants a wide viewing angle and to retain excellent black levels so should he go with one of these two screen materials or something else i think you should go with a projector that has two settings <laughs> one for uh that turns up the brightness during the time when you are playing when you're watching with the lights mm -hmm. on and one that has a i blacked out the room and i'm watching the movie setting and that you should just get a regular old screen that's what i think yeah, I'm I'm largely in favor of that too because I, I, I what you described for when lights are on, I'm like that doesn't, doesn't sound, sound like they're critical very enough. Very bright. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't sound like to have so, to have some lights on while you're watching sports so that you can see things that are going on in the room yeah. like, you know, you're eating or something like that. There's going to be enough light coming off the screen that mostly you can do that anyways, and then you add a little bit of ambient light, and you know it's not going to wash it out that much. You just have two settings on your, you know, two user settings on your uh, screen on your projector, so that one has the brightness up slightly, and one has it perfectly in tune for uh, low light. Yeah, and you get a regular old screen. I don't like ambient light rejecting screens in. Any setup, almost at all, that's outside of like an industrial, you know, or a uh, a business <laughs> right. thing like when, where you absolutely can't, the lights are on all the time right. and you are still competing with them, you want to, want to be able to see the image. That's right. Yeah. When, uh, yeah, when lights on is going to be the norm, then, yeah. okay, yeah, you got to look at ambient light rejecting, but it's like, now when you can have completely blacked out for movies and the only times you're going to have the lights on is a more casual viewing experience or basically in the background, like I wouldn't sacrifice on the movie experience one iota. I'd be like, well, I, and I, 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 I mean, I live think what's going to end up happening is he's going to hate the screen. Oh. You know, he's going to watch a movie and it's going to be like little hot spots here and there, mm -hmm. you know, and it's going to, you know, it's not going to look as good as it could because it, it's the, the dark, the black levels are never going to be as good as they should be because of the, the screen itself. I think he's going to hate the screen, well, you know, unless he I'll warn you, all, like never, that, almost never watched this movie. That black diamond from Screen Innovations, as expensive as it is, and it is an expensive screen, uh, I've, I've had... More than one person I've talked to privately, and this might is some some of them going back years, but n nobody was happy with it. They're like, it it definitely has a texture. It sparkles when you're in the dark. Ugh. It's like, no, no, you just, no, you don't do that. And the Elite Screen's Dark Star Nine isn't even available anymore. Now it's now they're all called Cinegray, either 5D or 3D. Um, I wouldn't do these. I mean, the the best ambient light rejecting screen, in my opinion, that you can get right now is Aluna Visions. Um, they're or Aurora. <laughs> yes, the the Aurora from Aluna Vision. That I mean, that's that's if if you had to get ambient light rejecting, that's the one I would get. But I wouldn't in your case. I would get a white screen in your case. You're not even a. You're not. You're not. Uh, are you? I don't think that you're an image anymore. I think you're just a black screen. Yeah. <laughs> so so whatever. It's so messed up. We're not even going to get through like five questions this podcast. So. That's because the questions are forever long. It's not my I know, fault. I know. So, uh, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. read about light. Uh, can we just skip this one? Because no, we already no, no. It's, okay it's, uh, this is good information for other things. So. All right. Reading about light, uh, about ambient light rejecting screens, he was a bit confused by some of the specs. What is the vertical half angle? How would that impact his setup where he'll be using a 120-inch screen, the bottom of which will be two feet, three inches off the floor, and his projector is six feet, six inches off the top of the off the floor on top of a cabinet at the back of the room. So 16 feet, 8 inches from lens to screen. I have no idea what that is. What's a vertical half angle? Right. So the idea is, let's say you had the projector directly in front of the screen, firing straight ahead right at the middle of the screen. 
All right. And okay. you took you took a measurement of how much light gets reflected off the screen of that. So that would be the exact on axis gain, right? And it's, so let's just right. say it, it's throwing out a thousand lumens and exactly a thousand lumens come back when the projector's right in front, right in the middle of the screen. Now you say, how high up can I stand up or place the projector up or down from that center position until what I end up seeing is half that brightness, right? Oh, okay. So well, that's the vertical half yeah. angle. So let's say you, let's say you can stand up and you know now you're a 30 or 40 de- elevation, uh, you know, 30 or 40 degree elevation angle above the middle of the screen, right? Projector stayed at the middle, but you are now 30 or 40 degrees higher than that. And you're still getting 900 or 800 lumens at that point, right? That means that the yeah. vertical half angle is way above that somewhere, which, right. you know, a, a perfectly even white screen would be like that. In fact, you'd have to be like, basically at almost 180 degrees to the screen before you'd notice a difference in how much light there is versus viewing straight on with the projector straight on. But with these ambient light rejecting screens, of course, they are shedding off light that's coming at them from an angle. So some of them shed off the light that's coming from above and below much more than they shed off the light that's coming from either side or vice versa. Like the ambient light rejecting screen that Seymour sells is designed to shed light that's coming from the sides, but then it doesn't shed very much light that's coming from above and below. So that might be helpful if your light is coming from a window rather than from overhead lighting, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the vertical half angle is how high do you have to get before the brightness is half of what it would be from dead ahead straight on. Um, so yeah, in his case, right, if, if he's going for a, like 120 inch screen, uh, the screen height of that is, uh, 58.8 inches. So you take half of that height and then you figure out, okay, you take whatever the vertical half angle is and you say, how much of an angle can I be above or below that midway point of the screen before it's going to be half as bright? That's basically what that's telling you. So he asks, what about screen gain? It seems that the ambient light rejecting screens that have a very narrow viewing angle from side to side start with a higher gain, but then rapidly get dimmer as you move to the sides. Meanwhile, screens like the Elite Dark Star 9, which doesn't exist anymore, and Screen Innovation's Black Diamond apparently start with a lower gain, but then remain close to the same brightness even as you move to the sides. So which is better? Depends on Um, where your light is coming from. Yeah, it's really, it's it's all about where uh, where your lights, what direction the light's coming because that's the you know, as you're moving to that side, just like what you were saying, saying about the, was the Loon Vision one, or the Seymour AV one, you know, if you, if projectors are generally above or below the screen, mm-hmm. then you don't want to reject the light coming from above or below the screen as much as the light coming from the sides, because you want that light that's coming from above or below, which gives you good viewing angles above and below. But as soon as you start moving to the sides, you start losing light like mm-hmm. crazy. So therefore, if you're sitting dead on, or you're standing up dead on, you've got a great image no matter what if you're sitting or standing. But if you are sitting dead on and then move over two feet or three feet or five feet, suddenly you're going to have completely different I mean, generally, images. if you were... I mean, this would be a weird theater to build, but if you were building a theater from scratch, but it's a case where it has to be a projector and there has to be ambient light, then normally you would probably opt to uh, have it's so that you could sit wider from side to side without it looking terrible in the side seats. But to right. do that, and, and then you would make sure that all your light is coming from overhead as opposed to any light coming from the sides of the room. But in order to do that, you need to try and get the projector to be as close height-wise to the audience's eyes as you can get because you don't want it rejecting the light that's coming from the projector that's you know mounted high up on your ceiling. You want right. to make sure that the light that's coming from the projector gets back to your eyes, so it needs to be, you know, close in height to where your eyes are. So that can be a challenge, right? The ambient light rejecting screens are always a challenge. But don't don't get a light rejection screen, please. Not in your set. You like, don't you don't need it for yours. Super begging you not to do this. Yeah. Like let, let, let's, all the money that you were going to spend <laughs> on the light rejecting screen. Yeah, put it screen, towards a light. Throw that in. <laughs> Oh, or just, you know, spend it on that subwoofer. So, uh, <laughs> so we recommend. All right, Nick. I guess later on, Todd. But anyways, Nick. Nick hasn't upgraded his TV yet, but he figures that when he does, he'll want the best streaming quality possible, including Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos support. I'm sorry about the answer to this question because I'm sure you're not going to like it. He knows we've said that the Apple TV 4K is our top pick, but he has an older Apple TV model and he hates the way its Netflix app performs. 
What bothers him is that when he's browsing his Netflix My List, it reshuffles the order to, of everything in the list every time he closes and opens reading Netflix. Yeah. Or even when he's just browsing and he clicks on a title to read the synopsis and then navig- navigates back to his list. Well, that's irritating. Mm-hmm. Furthermore, he hates that the cover art keeps changing as well. I don't think that's just the That's Apple just TV. a Netflix thing. Yeah. That's a Netflix thing. that They do that so that you'll you'll see a movie for the first time. Like, oh, who is that? Mo- oh. They oh, try to catch your eye. It? Did they see? Did I see this? I've actually started movies and gone. Oh yeah, I already yeah. saw this one. <laughs> Turn it off. He's resorted to looking things up on his phone and then just searching on his Apple TV once he's decided. He much prefers the Netflix interface on his Roku three, but that box has audio glitches when he's using his Onkyo's receiver. You got all kinds of problems, mm. dude. He knows the Netflix interface is something that can can and almost certainly will get updates in the future. But so what should he do? Should he just? Should he wait and hope that Roku adds Dolby Vision support? Should he, the Apple TV 4K still be his top choice? Is there a different streaming box that is better than in either of these options? You know what the answer to this question is? Ask us like the second before you're about to buy. Because, <laughs> yeah, things do because keep changing. This changes, yeah. this changes like week to week. I mean, right now the Apple 4K is looking like the best box It is the there. best Netflix external box that you can get. Because yeah. it, as far as I know... Um, and now it might be the only external box that, no, no, wait. So of course the, uh, the Xbox one S and X now support both Dolby vision and Dolby Atmos from Netflix. But, uh, in the case of the Xbox, it doesn't automatically switch audio formats. You know, everything comes out with an Atmos flag out of the Xbox. If you do that, whereas at least the Apple TV 4k automatically switches between audio formats. If it's in Atmos from Netflix, you get Atmos coming out of the Apple TV 4K. If it's 5.1, you get 5.1 coming out of the Apple TV 4K, exactly as you would want. And it switches between Dolby Vision and uh, standard dynamic range, and it switches between frame rates as well. So if Netflix, if the viewing experience and the listening experience from Netflix is what you want, the Apple TV 4K right this moment is the best external box to get for that service. The navigation side of it, uh, unfortunately, yeah, I kind of, you kind of got to live with what they give you because that that does change. It's changed multiple yeah. times in the time I've been using Netflix. Yeah. Uh, and you're going to find that, uh, like I said, ask us the second before you're going right. to buy. Yeah, because it, this could change. Yeah. It, it, this could change you know, by the, the time this podcast goes live. The honestly. Amazon Fire Stick 4K hardware-wise supports both Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos, but the Netflix app on it doesn't. But that right. could get updated, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so related to this, Todd asked on Twitter, now that the Xbox One S and X have received their Dolby Vision firmware update, does that make them the best 4K HDR and Apple streaming boxes? No. No. Because Microsoft is never going to fix that audio Apparently thing. not. They are never going to fix not it. Not only that, and I, I mean, the only thing that Dolby Vision officially works on right now is Netflix. Uh, okay. on the Xbox One S and X. Now, of course, that can get updated in the future as apps get updated, but at the at, as we're recording this on October 15th, 2018, the Netflix app is the only thing that does Dolby Vision on the Xbox One S and X, so you can't call it the best 4K HDR streaming box because there's only right. one service that that's true for, But and it right. doesn't handle the audio really properly. And it's never going to. I've given up. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've given much. up. There's no hope. There's just. I mean, it, it can no do hope. it. It's just you. You have to manually switch between Atmos and five point one. It doesn't automatically. do I'm not it. doing that. It's I know. Stupid. I've it's not even to stereo. switch between a- Atmos and, and five point one. You switch between Atmos and stereo. Yeah. So you can at least get some up mixing. Hey, right. Stupid box. All right, Abhu on Twitter. Throwback. If you have an HD DVD player, and Rob does, I do, and some HD DVDs, which Rob also oh, does, yes. and I just got rid of. I'll be honest with you. I think last year that I might be wrong. I might still have it. Huh. <laughs> I think I might still have it. I think I got rid of it. I think I got rid of it, and all my HD DVDs. I think I got rid of it. But maybe not. Anyways, uh, if you have an HD DVD player and some HD HD DVDs, and if those of you who are too young to know what this is, this was what this was the format war with uh, Blu-ray. Right. So when we went from DVDs to Blu-rays, there was HD DVDs came at the same times, and then they were fighting Toshiba and for about ones. a year. And you connect it to with a new 4K TV with HDR, just turning on deep color, and the HD DVD player lets you take advantage of the 4K HDR's TV capabilities. Nope. Uh, I, do they even have 
Do they have deep color? They do have a deep color oh, setting. Yeah. It was never used for anything. Okay. Because yeah. what is on the HD DVD discs themselves is 8-bit. It's still SDR. Yeah, yeah. It's still 8-bit. So uh, yeah. the deep color was there as something that could be supported if there ever were 10 or 12-bit sources. That, right. That, but there weren't. So it's useless. <laughs> yeah. So is there any da downsides to daisy chaining a second surround speaker on each side? Depends on what well, you mean, exactly you mean by daisy chaining. Yeah, well, there's that. Yeah, sure. Uh, if you wire them in parallel, you could be, you're asking your amplifier to handle a load. Maybe it's not capable. And when you just say daisy chaining, it makes me think it might be parallel wiring. Yeah, if you're doing it in series, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Uh, s there's a cost associated with it. Uh, the, yeah, I mean, if you are you're buying another pair of speakers for sure. Well, of course. So there's that. That's a downside. <laughs> uh, there is also like, you know, if, if the size of your room doesn't really call for it, then you've got two speakers over there doing weirdness. I mean, there's. <sighs> For me, the downside is the upside of doing this is when you have multiple rows of seats yes. and you're trying to get a nice, you know, side surround for everybody. Yeah, so that one but row of you seats, have, the surround effects aren't coming from in front of that row. Right. Yeah. If you have one row of seats with an with a, a, a mm. correctly placed surround speaker, you have everything you need. Sure. You have putting a second speaker there or a second speaker in front of you, I guess, or or a second speaker even further behind you than that one. I don't think it adds anything. I, and in fact, I think that would, in a lot of ways, mess up the sound that you're, I mean, that you're getting. I mean, it's just going to cause another reflection point. And I mean, it's going to make it sound a little bit more diffuse, I suppose. But with Atmos, we're not really going for that anymore. We've gotten away from all of that. Everything's supposed to be, you know, single point of reference. Yeah. So I, 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 I don't think there's necessarily downsides. Unless you don't need them, in which case, why are you doing it? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, if, if you have them, I'm not going to go in there and say, "Oh, you got to take that down because that's hurting what you're doing." I'm like, "That's no." Nah, I'd be like, "Okay, so that's neat. You yeah, got no, there's four there's no speakers big... stacked on top of each other right there, huh? <laughs> is that what you're doing? No, you making downside. a little line array. I, I would just say <laughs> though, if what you've done is you know you ran the red and the black leads from the AV receiver to your first speaker, and then you just connected mm -hmm. a speaker wire from the first speaker to the second speaker. That is parallel wiring. Yeah. Right. That is all the That's... red sides are connected to red and all the black sides are connected to black. That's parallel wiring. You wouldn't probably want to do that. Uh, it's not necessarily the end of the world. It depends on the impedance of your speakers. But most speakers dip down to at least four ohms, if not down to like 3.2 or something at certain frequencies. And if yeah. you've wired in parallel, now you've cut that in half. So you could be dealing with like a two ohm load at certain frequencies, which most AV receivers are not going to be happy with. So as long as you've wired in series, which is you take the black lead from the AV receiver, it goes to the black input of speaker number one. You take the red lead from the AV receiver, and that goes to the red input of speaker number two. And then you connect speaker number one and speaker number two together with the remaining binding posts. That's wiring it in series and that will be fine all right so if tom or robert is having a guest over and we want to show off our display what is our go-to movie for doing so our display i did not read this correctly the okay. first time our display. yeah you want to show off your projector in your case in my case i'd be showing off either my oled or my sony uh z90 so i'm gonna be Honest with you, I thought this was an audio question, nope. but uh, the answer is the same regardless. I find that the most impressive thing to show somebody is something that they actually want to watch. Sure. <laughs> so I let them choose. And this is one of the reasons why my kids were like, this just this week, my youngest son finished the Maze Runner uh, book. And my wife was like, oh, well, watch the Maze Runner movie. And I'm like, we can't. We don't own it. And I thought we did, but we don't. Uh, I thought somebody had gotten it for Christmas or something. But they didn't. And uh, we had rented it one time. Because that's how I saw it. And their kids were like, oh, we should buy it. I'm like, I'm not buying it. Well, why not? I'm like, because I don't want that. Piece Isn't of it on Netflix? In my collection. It is not. Oh. It's not on anything. Okay. 
it's, it's this the, I checked all three services and that I have here, which is Hulu, Netflix, and Amazon, and you can rent it from Amazon. Okay. Which is something I'll probably do for him, but I will not buy it because I don't want people to go through my thing and go, oh look at there's the Maze Runner. I'll watch that. <laughs> no, there are no crappy movies up there. I get rid of them all. So I let people choose. That's what I do. Okay. Now there's lots of movies up there that have you know really interesting visuals and stuff that I could, you know, maybe use to show some things off. Any of the 4K stuff, obviously, you know, would be great if you if I had a 4K display, which I do not. So, you know, it's a lot of times it's like pick a Blu-ray and let's just go with that. All right. Uh, I'll give my answer, which is The Martian. That That's my go-to right now. Yeah. Yep. It's got some great HDR at the beginning, which is very easy to see. Yeah. And there's also a 3D version. So if I'm doing it on my Z9D, I can do the 3D version too. Same movie. Ken. Ken has a, a Denon AVR X4000, but now he's upgrading to a 4K HDR TV, and he only has a 5.1 setup, so he's strongly considering a Denon uh, AVR X3400H. Uh, However, his local dealer offered him a discount on the brand new X3500H for 875 That seemed like a pretty good deal, although the X3400 is even less expensive than that. So any reason to pay a bit more for the newer model. 3400 versus 3500 mm -hmm. uh, on this thing. I, I don't remember there being any sort of major improvements from last year's models of these year's models. Isn't like all Heos and stuff. Uh, very, very, very little has changed, but there's one significant difference between the 3400 and the 3500, and that's the 3500 now has a phono input. No. So if you've got a record so, player, no difference. That, <laughs> that could be entirely a reason. Apparently, the 3500 is pre-programmed to accept more commands from Echo devices. Okay. I don't exactly know. That seems like something that should be software updatable, but I, I don't know. That's what's been said. But other than that, there's essentially no difference. Like, they're both going to get eARC via firmware updates. Um, okay. So, yeah. Uh, also, you can get the X3500H for $800 directly from Denon. <laughs> so 875 <laughs> so you is not a good deal <laughs> well it is considering the market price that you would normally right well yeah up. i mean the msrp is a thousand dollars but uh but they're selling it for 800 bucks directly from denon themselves right now so if you were going to get the 3500h i, I wouldn't spend 75 dollars more to get it but yeah unless you really need the phono input uh no save the money and get the 3400 so his old tv was an lg 55 inch LH90. He wanted a big screen and a picture quality upgrade, so he decided to go with the Samsung 75-inch q 9 f a very nice TV. Being a Samsung, it does HDR10+, Plus, but it does not do Dolby Vision, so he's trying to figure out which Ultra HD Blu-ray player to pair with it. Does he need an HDR10 Plus player? Can the Samsung q 9 fn turn regular HDR10 into HDR10 Plus on its own? Searching for an HDR10 Plus player led him to the Panasonic UB820. Is that his best choice? Is that his best choice? Well, if you're in North America, it is the only one you can buy right this second that does HDR10+. Plus. There's going to be so much of stuff, other stuff just coming out, though. Now that we've got the IMAX thing, too, it's going to right. be... Right, well, there, there's your first discs that actually are in HDR10+. Plus. So uh, yeah. so there's that. They, they, they do exist. Um, now, if you wait a little bit, the Panasonic UB420 is supposed to be coming out at some point in North America. I don't exactly know when, but it's supposed to be. And the difference there is that the 820 does both HDR10 Plus and Dolby Vision, whereas the 420 only does HDR10 Plus. And of course, they both do regular HDR10. So since hmm. you don't need Dolby Vision, there's no reason to spend more on the 820 other than if you want it right this second, because you can't seem to get the 420 in North America yet. So the Dolby Vision is a is not firm. It's a hardware. I thought it was firmware. So no, at I mean, some point well, Samsung could could decide to do Dolby Vision. Well, right? probably I mean, not. I mean, there's a hardware version and there is kind of a software version, but you need a lot mm. of processing power if it's the software version. Right. Okay. So in players, it's usually built into the chip, which which Samsung isn't doing. Um, yeah. So I mean, so 
answer one of the questions, there is no way to turn regular HDR10 into HDR10+. No. HDR10 Plus is that the the software, the movie itself, has been encoded using HDR10+, Plus, and now you need to play it back. There's no way to turn static metadata HDR10 into dynamic metadata HDR10+. Plus. What you can do is like what LG does on their OLEDs or what Sony now does on their newest A9F OLED, uh, which is to analyze the HDR10 signal on the fly and change it inside of the display. They call that active HDR. Um, but that's, you know, that's a completely different thing. That's that's just inside right. of the display. And it still isn't HDR10+. Plus. It's just no, a it's different not. way of handling regular HDR10. So if you want to play back the, I don't know how many discs are ever going to come out in HDR10+, Plus, but apparently IMAX enhanced ones will, so if you want to play those discs in HDR10+, Plus, then you do need a player that handles HDR10+. Plus. The Panasonic seem like the obvious choice. If you're willing to wait, the 420 will cost less than the 820. Uh, yeah, that's all of that. So he mostly still gets physical Blu-ray discs from Netflix. Will his choice of Ultra HD Blu-ray player make a big difference in the picture quality? Not from regular Blu-rays. Uh, no. I mean, not from regular Blu-rays. <laughs> I mean, they're just going to look the same. Yep. I mean, they're just going to be bigger. Yeah, so not from regular Blu-rays. I will say, since you're getting this really nice 75-inch 4K HDR display, uh, look into rent4k.com because Netflix right now doesn't rent out Ultra HD Blu-rays in their disc by mail service. Uh, but rent4k.com does. So that's a way to rent Ultra HD Blu-rays by mail. All right. Uh, okay, so this comes from a listener who I guess is from Twitter. Is that Twitter? Is this uh, no, it was from? it was an email, but this is the only identifying name I had. Oh, uh, the only identifying name on this email was C R P C S E A, as in the C. Yes. And then a capital R, and then a new word, P P E A, like a P that you P that you eat. Yes. Right. Okay. I guess Jonathan as well. This is these we're, two we're people combining a few because they're very similar. Okay, for, first couple of comments from CRP says that they found the AV rant after Home Theater Geeks got canceled. Sorry. And they quickly decided to support us via Patreon. Yay! And subscribe to us on YouTube. Yay! Okay, Thank one you. thing that we mentioned that, uh, just in passing is how uh, your two ears might have different size openings, so it's perfectly okay to use two different size ear tips on your in-ear in monitors. That was an aha moment for CRP. Guess what, dude? When I came up with it, it was the aha moment for me. I was like sitting there struggling with one falling out and then the other one falling out and another one being fine. And I switched the ear tips on both of them and I put them in. And then the the, the one that was fall, was fine before is now falling out and the other one is fine. I'm like, what am I going to do? I, <laughs> what am I going to do? And I finally went, oh, wait a second here. Let me just switch these. I don't have to use the same size ear tips. That was so strange. They don't have to be okay. perfectly symmetrical. You might not be. That's right. <laughs> so why on earth, he asks, uh, or she asks, do we don't know who CR, what kind of gender I don't, that is not uh, a That is not a gender-specific name whatsoever. That's right. Do we have, oh, why on earth do we have to adjust our volume settings so much? We have all this fancy HDR video processing and decoding for a zillion Atmos speaker positions, but if you switch between Xbox and Roku and the laptop, they all put different volume levels. Even if you just switch between different apps on one device, you get different volume output levels. And even if you just use one app on one device, you might get different volume levels from show to show. With so much processing power at our fingertips, why isn't there a simple way to say, this is the level I want for this di for dialogue. This is as quiet as everyone wants this to be for whispers. This is as loud as everyone to be for explosions. Now apply those levels to everything I listen to. And along similar lines, Jonathan and his wife recently watched uh, Melancholia on Blu-ray. I have never heard of this. What is That's this, a, a Kristen Dunst movie. That's all I know about it. I like Kristen Dunst. He found that the soundtrack had an extremely large dynamic range. The opening prologue uses overture from Wag uh, Wagner's Tristan und uh, uh, Isolde. It's Tristan Isolde. I can't say that. Uh and the crescendo at the end was deafening. His wife exclaimed that it was way too loud, so he turned it down. But then there were people whispering in the dialogue, so he had turned back up. Jonathan is perfectly fine with the massive dynamic range, but he's aware he could use uh, Odyssey's dynamic volume or some other method of dynamic range compression. But what surprised and annoyed him 
a bit is the, that the whispering was so quiet in this particular movie that he actually ended up turning up the volume even higher than where he had it to begin with. And then, of course, the crescendo at the end of the movie was that at the end of the world levels. Yeah. So basically, finding the appropriate vol volume level was a matter of trial and error, and that doesn't really seem to be a way to know beforehand if your selected volume level will end up being a bit too quiet for some of the softest sounds. So could movies maybe include some sort of calibration options uh, you can you could run before the movie begins, maybe play the quietest part of the movie so you can adjust it before the movie starts and then offer either uh, then either the, offer the loudest part of the movie too so that you'll know whether you need to turn the dynamic volume uh, on or not. Or just use uh, just list how much louder the loudest part of the movie is going to be. He hates the distraction of having to adjust the volume while the movie is playing. Is he alone in this? Well, apparently not. Nope. Um, <laughs> no, you're definitely not alone. So, okay, so A Quiet Place, which is the movie I just bought and I really liked uh, quite a bit, it has uh, a fairly large dynamic range because everybody's got to be quiet mm -hmm. because of the things. So um, when the sounds are loud, they're really freaking loud, but it, it, it's part of the movie. Honestly, I'm going to be honest with you, I have very rarely experienced. Now, what you're what you're talking about here, the differences, or what C rp in cincinnati or whatever his name is he uh or she uh was describing between different like apps and stuff like that totally true yep, and yes yep. it's a little it's a little irksome like i know when i'm on youtube i need to negative 30 right I, on the xbox i know when it's on netflix it's negative 15 i know when it's on hulu it's negative five i know when i'm watching a, a, a blu-ray or an ultra hd blu-ray and my wife is asleep it's negative 10 to 12 when she's not asleep it's negative three to five right i i usually keep it around those levels i just know that is it irritating yes what are you gonna do because there's something could be done probably but who cares and even those general rules different. of thumb that you have those aren't a hundred percent there are exceptions no that, all that's those, for right? that one device switch devices yeah. and everything goes out the window i gotta do it all so over like jonathan again. says it ends up kind of being trial and error depending on the exact yeah. thing you happen to be watching yeah that's true now i'll be honest with you the movie that he's talking about though that i think that's poor mixing I mean, I I really do. I well, mean, I mean the mass, to have that massive of a dynamic range. Yeah. Oh, is, and I mean, th there are people commenting on out there about h just how quiet the whispers are. They're like, this is absurdly quiet, right? Yeah. Which either yeah. means maybe you weren't really even supposed to be able to make out what they were saying. That might have even been the intention, or they they mastered it in an exceedingly quiet room that basically nobody's home environment matches, right? where the, the ambient noise level was so low where they mastered it that they could hear it, you know, at regular no, reference volume. That. But anybody at home is like, no, but just, you know, the fact that I'm in a normal house, it's too loud, the ambient noise to yeah. make out these whispers, and then I get my ears blasted off when it plays the crescendo. Yeah, yeah I, I hear you on that. I mean, basically, Dolby tried to address this. This is what Dolby's right. dialogue normalization is entirely about. The whole idea was that anything that was encoded in a Dolby audio signal, whether that was regular Dolby Digital or when they went to Dolby Digital Plus or True HD or now Atmos, all of those can use Dolby's dialogue normalization. And the whole idea was that there's supposed to be a bit of code in there that says this is the average dialogue level. That gets normalized across everything that you watch with a Dolby audio signal. And then it says, okay, the loudest thing is this much louder than that level. The quietest thing is this much quieter. But it all kind of balances out because it's based on the average dialogue level. That's exactly right. what Dolby was trying to do. The problem is not everything uses Dolby. And even the stuff that does use Dolby doesn't necessarily use their dialogue normalization. So they put right. the thing out there, but nobody is obligated to use it. Um... I mean, you, you, there is a standard, right? We have reference volume. This is a standard, but not everything uses it. YouTube certainly does Clearly. it. Clearly. Yeah. I hate YouTube. I mean, I, I watch YouTube like almost constantly. I yeah. hate it. it. It is so irritating how like the commercials are so loud and it seems like the content creators just cannot get their volume level yeah. correct. I don't know how ours sounds, to be honest with you. I, I try it, to make it even at least from episode to episode. Those people are watching them back to back. They're not having you know jumps in volume right. but i i don't painstakingly do that so there definitely could be differences from video yeah, to video yeah. but i mean yes you could turn on something like odyssey's dynamic volume and right. try to try to um well i mean again you know dolby's this, but... dynamic range thing that they call dolby volume i always thought that did the best job of this 
Um, yeah. But it is compressing the dynamic range somewhat, so you're you're no longer hearing exactly what was on the recording. But the you know essentially what people are saying is exactly what's on the recording isn't always pleasing, is it? All right. I really just think that that this what he's describing with this one particular movie is just poor mixing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I really yeah. do. Yeah. And and I mean, this is a case where maybe you do want to turn on dynamic volume that could really, really right. help you with this one particular thing. But so or I mean, but get, both get it the right volume and then turn on subtitles. <laughs> so right. Yeah. Which some people resort people to say. But, you know, yeah, both CRP and do. Jonathan are asking, is is there some way we could set things up beforehand so that while we're watching the thing, we don't have to, you know, ride the volume rocker? Right? Is there some way we could adjust this beforehand? Uh, I mean, both of these suggestions, yeah, which absolutely. are rather similar, yeah. these do seem like kind of reasonable things to be done. It's I, yeah. I wouldn't hold my breath for any of it to happen, but I, 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 I quite like these suggestions. That would actually make a lot of yeah. sense, wouldn't it? Well, I mean, I don't. I mean, I just think that 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 there the stand there should be a standard set and it should be followed by everybody. Right. I mean okay? the closest we can I've, get is Dolby's dialogue normalization plus right. something like Dolby volume or Odyssey dynamic volume. That's the closest we can get to it, but it by yeah. no means solves the issue that you're describing. Right. Seven point two, he says well, I don't know. This is Jonathan. This. Yeah. I guess is Jonathan. Even though it doesn't have any overhead or height speakers, uh, is officially an Atmos compatible speaker configuration, correct? So if you're using a seven point two speaker setup what happens to the overhead sounds? Do they just get played out of the front, left, and right, and surround back speakers? Yeah. For the most get, part, they, yes. They, yeah. yeah. There's yeah. there's a little bit of uh, like phase and sometimes a tiny little bit of reverb going on in some other speaker channels because they're trying, they're still trying to create the illusion that the sound is coming from overhead. So uh, it's not right. necessarily like, you know, what would have played out of your, uh, you know, top rear speaker is strictly coming out of your surround back speaker now it's not necessarily right. one to one like that but yes no, more it's or be, less. It's, they're going to use phase between more you know the right. different speakers to try to try to put that sound back up there which is what they would have done in the 7.2 soundtrack in the out that's so. right yeah if they had just mixed it in 7.2 to begin with but yeah your uh, yeah. 7.2 is an atmos compatible speaker configuration if if that's what you've set up is 7.2 all of your speakers at the floor level but you play a disc that has dolby atmos on it you will see dolby atmos come up on the front of your av receiver it won't down mix it to some other format uh and sure. then yeah it it you will still hear all of the sounds they just might might not be as precisely placed as if you had physical speakers above you so he's, uh, this is uh, CRP mm -hmm. in Cincinnati. Um, we've done a few interviews, and, and CRP thought they were good and comparable to what the home theater geeks offered, which which apparently they miss very much. Could we do more of those? I mean, technically, yes. <laughs> right. It's... You know, let me be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you. Okay, I have a member of a Facebook group. Uh, I don't know how it became. I got invited to it. It's a podcasters group, right? And it's all these people who are just starting off with podcasts and almost all of them are doing interviews right that's all it is it, it's it's podcast with two random dudes drinking whiskey and talking about whatever they want to talk about uh, or interviews within a niche mm -hmm. of, of society and and i've got no problems with those podcasts but invariably the the the, the complaints are setting up guests is difficult yes they don't you know they they cancel on you technical glitches yes. they you know you how do i get them to have good equipment so that whatever should i send them equipment should i do this or this it is a pain so are we okay right now because of my new job my new my new uh, business i am more capable of doing interviews than i have been rob's job is much more structured than mine so he's less capable than i am but we can normally do stuff like that will we do it Sure. <laughs> if the opportunity presents itself, I got no problems doing interviews on this podcast. We've done it before. I would do it again. Oh, yeah. No, but yeah. So I'm, certainly, I'm not like rejecting uh, re rejecting interviews. No way. No. I, just, I, I wish I, I could. I, I am more. uninterested in a actively pursuing them is what it really comes down it's, to. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of prep. There are the technical glitches to come over, the, the scheduling hurdles. I mean... I was blown away by home theater geeks week after week because yeah. I'm like, holy crap, the amount of work that Scott must have put into that and his producer, John, who who did a lot behind the scenes. Like right. the amount of work that went into that, I'm like, there's no way I could do it. Not, not they for do lack of desire. Did they do call-ins or did they do face-to-face? -face? Oh, no, they were face-to-face. -face. They were basically on Skype. 
Okay. You know, yeah. but I mean, uh, you know, not not for lack of desire on my part. It's just for lack of of time and <laughs> really just time. Um, so yeah. yeah, I mean, I I miss home theater geeks a lot too. I really loved when they were on because I was like, this is a fantastic, um, you know, like not counter. What what am I looking for? Uh, uh, Co podcast to ours, right? We offered different yeah. things. Uh, got, yeah. I learned a ton from from listening to Home Theater Geeks, so I, I miss it very much. Um, but yeah, I, turning AV Rant into something more similar to Home Theater Geeks or adding to AV Rant to make it, you know, also Home Theater Geeks, uh, it's it's just beyond the, the time resources that I have. Nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it, it, like I said, it, it's, it's fine. I mean, occasionally we're going to have an opportunity to do stuff like that. And when we do, I will be happy to do it. Yeah. Uh, but the times it's that we have, it's, gonna... it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Yes, it's a lot of work, and invariably, you know, I don't think we've ever done an interview that didn't have a little bit of a technical That's glitch right. yeah. at some point, point. and it's you know, it's always been sort of an issue, and editing becomes much harder on every side. Now, and, uh, if somebody wants to give us infinity dollars per month, then I'll then interview here the we heck go. out of some people's. Yeah, <laughs> we'll be inter- we'll be interviewing all the people's. I'll interview them to start with. Like, where did you get your infinity dollars? And thank you for giving it to us. (laughs) All right. That's going to be it for this week. Really? We're only going to do five questions. We did eight. I know. We Those left really more than half, but uh, a lot of that is my that's fault right. and Google's that, fault I'm blaming mostly. That's not really your fault, but at the same time, those questions were really long. So saying that we there only were. answered eight questions, yeah. it's not fair. So what do we got left? Whoa, we got a ton. So uh, Josh S., uh, Chris H., Luke K., Terry G., <laughs> John D., Ilongo and David C, who both asked very similar questions, so I combined them. Uh, Brandon M, ooh, Miles W, and that was it. So yeah, okay. we made it. Those questions half. have always got to be a lot shorter. Than... Those are all a lot shorter, but yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. When we have questions through G and H, you know, I don't want to hear that we didn't answer very many. All right. <laughs> Well, lastly, let's once again thank our listeners of the week. I'm going to thank Brandon for going to www.avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link and leaving us a PayPal donation, as well as our 73 patrons over at patreon.com. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, patrons. Yeah, Brandon, thank you very much for that PayPal donation and uh, patreon.com slash podcast if you'd like to sign up for a automatic monthly donation to us. And thanks very much to our 73 patrons over there. Lastly, we'll thank Sean for talking us up to RBH. Thank you very much, Sean. Yeah, Sean, congrats on that R515 center speaker purchase, and thanks very much for talking us up to RBH. If you want to get your question answered on this podcast, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something. We still got to do the pop. Yep. One, two, three, pop. pop. All right, starting. What a shambles. Yeah, <laughs> hello there. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love how Rob oh, gets my, angry. What is, what is going on with my microphone now? Why am I so loud? Oh, Rob. What is The universe is, is conspiring on? against you. <laughs> okay, so welcome to behind the scenes of AV Rant. This is the most behind the scenes of ever. Um, I don't know what Google uh... changed. I changed nothing on my computer and there was no Windows update. So Google changed something as far as I'm concerned behind the scenes where now I can't show my Chrome live... is totally different now, right? Huh? Chrome looks totally different now? Doesn't yeah, Chrome look different for you? Yeah, it's all bloody different. I So I can't do my live... <laughs> camera feed and also record my camera feed apparently 
This is not a thing that can work right now. We'll have to figure it out for next week. Anyway, you can hear our voices. This this is going to be the video. Is is logos switching back and forth? Thrilling as that's going to be. And I tried to make my logo be. Oh wait, what did I why do? is my voice uh, showing up so loud? I didn't. I tr- I tried to make my logo be AB Rant as well, but it kept switching back to Fearless Mobile Climbing. So well, that's fine. now you just know who's talking. Exactly. I I show up as the AV Rant logo. I believe it's what I believe. Will you happen. do were yes, you do. Yes, this you is do. brutal. Anyway, it's start showing up, <laughs> showing up as something. For else. anyone watching like a slash little, my listening little to the behind the scenes <laughs> version, you are definitely going to want to look for the completed video version this week because where you'll be able to see the pictures that, for sure. That'll actually be a video as opposed to this nonsense. Man, God, they just like to kick <laughs> podcasters around, don't they? Well, let's 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 change something. Why why would you possibly need things to work the way they've worked? Why do I have an incoming video call? Who the hell is trying to call me? From you? I didn't do it. I don't know. <laughs> I hung up on you anyway. Dear, I haven't done it. Sweet Lord. Oh, it could be is... one of the. It could be the kids in the other room. It could be my. It could be my wife or kids uh-huh. in the other room trying to close that thing. Okay. Anyway, right. um, guess I don't have to switch to you. <laughs> no. Mr. Don't do that. Global Climate. It's uh, me. Apologies for what this behind the scenes is, but man, oh man, if this is behind the scenes. This is what happens sometimes. Okay, we're super late. All right, 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 so right, I'm right, going to go, go and yeah, there we go. Yeah, okay, we go.